One of the real challenges of modeling these architecturally significant houses is that often the geometry doesn't conform to a you know, kind of standard XY orthogonal grid. A lot of the architects at this period in time were experimenting with alternative, alternative grid patterns and geometries that were just a little bit more interesting. So as you try to model these houses, the standard Revit components and furniture that are coming right out of the box may not suit your needs. And if you'd like to have an accurate model that includes those sorts of elements, you need to do a little customization to kind of really complete your model. So let's take a look at an example of something like that. This is a model I did for just, oh, another project, the BIM curriculum project, where we took a look at, you know, the Palmer House by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it's one that I sort of thought was particularly interesting. It's built on a triangular grid. So, if, for example, we go ahead and take a look at the, the living area. You can see there's sort of a problem with a house like this in terms of trying to come up with furniture because since none of the walls are at 90 degrees, all your standard elements, uh, just everything from beds to desks to dressers to oh, uh, bathtubs to just anything like that, needs to be a little bit custom to go ahead and fit this geometry. So you can go ahead and do stuff like that. Uh, for the project here, which is actually, again, part of the BIM curriculum, we actually did some custom modeling where, for example, in the dining area, we had some uh, standard components for barrel chairs, a Frank Lloyd Wright favorite. But when it came time to do something like this dining room table, okay, it really was just sort of a very custom piece of geometry. And we could create that custom piece of geometry. It had to conform to the wall surfaces, but we made it out of a series of extrusions, okay, that would actually fit that geometry. And that's kind of a kind of a way that we can really go through and create almost anything we need. Another example is if we go to the master bedroom, like the bedroom or the bed in there was actually quite, quite special. It looked something like a platform bed, had a very custom shaped mattress, and even the whole headboard assembly was made up of a series of different extrusions and voids to go through and create that. So what I want to illustrate for you is really how we can go ahead and do things like that using some examples from the King's Road house, uh, particularly the fireplace and the hood for the fireplace, which are just sort of good examples of like uh, the types of things you need to create sometimes. So let's go ahead and I'm going to start by just creating a new project and we can start thinking about how we can add pieces like this to it. So I'll just start a new project. And in terms of what's going on in here, oh, I'll just kind of create a couple different walls to kind of illustrate the point. I'll start by just putting out some walls that are relatively uh, rectangular. Then we'll go through and put some that are really uh, kind of following more of an interesting pattern. So let me do the 60 degree walls, which are really sort of more typical of hexagonal pattern or the triangle pattern, okay, something like that. So here's the basic deal in terms of creating things like this. If we go through and we want to create a real, really just any custom element, what we have to do is actually start thinking about how to form that using some just uh, standard geometric primitives. Okay, so as we go through and try and put furniture into our buildings or put to toilets and bathtubs and standard components, we typically say place a component and go out to the library and either load in something or pull something in, like a standard desk or a standard bed or something like that. So for example, if I go to furniture, I can take a look and pull in a chair. Let me see if I can just find a bed, kind of just a standard bed. And we'll go ahead and drop it on in. Maybe even rotate it around. The truth is all these different things, all these different components are really just made up of different extrusions, blends, things like that. And if you really want to start to get a sense of how anything's made up, what you can do is just edit the family, choose it, and say edit the family. And you'll be brought back to an editor where you can actually start interrogating and exploring it a little bit. So for example, you can see that's actually just an extrusion. Okay, that's another extrusion for the mattress. That is another extrusion, but extruded in the other direction for the pillow. Looks like these are even little extrusions. Those are extrusions, just circles that are brought up to be the little uh, bed uh, legs at the bottom. And we can start messing around with any of these things. So for example, if I just want to get rid of that pillow, I can do that. If I want to go through and change the dimensions of something, I can start pushing and pulling. 
can change. It looks like those two are constrained together right now. What else can we do? We can even edit the extrusion. You can sort of see what the pattern is the extrusion that got brought up. We'll start changing that. I'll just remove the constraint that locked those things together. Okay, we can really start creating almost any custom piece of furniture or any assembly we want to. And that's really the you know the start of where we're going to be going with all this. A classic example of something that you may need to model as a custom component is just a countertop. Because if you think about how countertops appear in a building, typically they're really conforming to the geometry of the walls and the spaces around them. They really tend to be very custom. So if, for example, if we go back to... Oh, where did I go? Let me close out these. And go back to that new project. Roll back out. If, for example, I wanted to put a countertop in this corner, I might have to go through and do something a little bit custom to make that happen. Let's rotate the bed just so that it uh, it's not facing in that direction. I'll just RO. And I can bring it back up against the wall. Okay. To make the countertop, what I would want to do is something like this. I can go back to the Home tab, and instead of placing a component, I can do something called Modeling in Place. And Modeling in Place will let us create custom components using blends and extrusions and sweeps and revolves, things like that. So if you choose Model in Place, here's how the basic procedure works. Every component we create is, needs a category. The category is really just the type of object that you're creating. And we choose the category because this determines really when it will be visible, when it won't be visible, based on the visibility graphic settings. So if I'm going to go through and create a countertop, I might call that a piece of casework. That's how I usually think of countertops. I can go through and give it a name. Everything needs a name because when it has a name, it shows up down here in the little browser. We can go ahead and choose it there. Okay, in terms of making that countertop, you'll see we're now in a special editing mode that'll let us go through and create extrusions, blends, revolve, sweeps, just all the geometric primitives you may be used to working with. And a countertop you can think of as really being an extruded surface. Generally what I do is draw the profile in the plan view and then just create an extrusion that runs from about 2 foot 10 off the floor, 2 foot 10 and a half actually, all the way up to 3 feet, which is kind of the standard thickness, inch and a half for a countertop, putting it at the US standard height for countertops. So if I say extrusion, what I can do is even go through and pick, and what I like to do is actually go through and just pick the wall interior surfaces. Then I'll go through and actually do some more picking, but I'll pick with an offset of two feet, or two foot one is actually a slightly better one in terms of really modeling the way countertops typically work here. I need to go through and close that extrusion so, for example, I'll just put a... actually, I should turn off the uh, offset before I do that. Here, maybe up to there. And using the pink line rules, and what I need to do is trim this up so that the continuous boundary okay, forms one loop with no overlapping or discontinuous segments. As I go through and complete that sort of profile, which is going to be extruded, I can set a couple different parameters for the extrusion. For example, I can go through and set the bottom of it. That's the start of it. I'm going to set 2 foot 10 and a half. I'm going to set the top of it to be 3 feet. I can also assign a material. So a good idea would be to go through and have some sort of material, like the countertop. And I can assign a graphic appearance and a color to it. I'm going to make it sort of just really easy to spot. I'll make it kind of that teal color. Mm -hmm. Maybe with a solid fill. Actually, that would be fill in the black. Never mind. I'll go ahead and make that just none. Say OK. And when I complete this, what I will have created is actually one piece of this object. 
Here's the deal. In terms of creating these custom components, sometimes we need to go through and make them out of several different extrusions, or an extrusion and a blend, or several different pieces. So if you want to go through and create something out of several different pieces, you can create one extrusion first, then create a second form, then create a third form, and close it all up. It'll still be all part of the same custom component. If I only want to have that countertop, I can go ahead and close it now. I'll say finish the model and then that will be intact. Let me kind of do a little consistent coloring so you can sort of see it there. And if I pop into 3D and maybe orbit this around a little bit, you'll see there it is. Okay, and there we have that custom countertop. So that's really the essence of it in terms of what we're going to be doing is we can go through and create these kind of custom shapes. Now, for the countertop, and a good example of how you might want to go through and add several pieces is, for example, if you want to go through and for example, put a backsplash on it, what you can do is edit this to open it up so I can add a second piece to it. Let me go back to the floor plan view. And if I want to go through and create another extrusion, I'll say extrude again. And I can start thinking about how I want to go through and define that backsplash. I might define that as being something like this. I'll pick the existing edges for the front of the backsplash, the front edges of that. I'll make them about an inch off the back. See if I can roll on in there and get that here and here. And I will trim, TR to trim. And again, I need to make this a continuous loop. Come back over here. Oops, looks like I got didn't do a good job of selecting those. Let's try this again. Okay, there we go. So trim, I'll select this piece. I'm clicking on the parts I want to keep. Now for this one, I'm going to change the start and the end of the extrusion to be a little bit different. The start will be at 3 feet because I want it to sit on top of the counterfoot, maybe at countertop, maybe up to 3 foot 4. Say OK. Looks like something currently intersects. Let me go ahead and show and see where it is. Looks like maybe I didn't do a good job of trimming up over here. Or when I undid, I might have gotten rid of that. Let me trim that again. Try closing that up. There we go. And now if I look at that in 3D, you'll see I have something that looks like a countertop. Okay, and that's an example of how we can go through and create just a custom piece. So let's go ahead and take a look at some other examples and think about how we can model some specific things that you need to do for some of the Schindler houses. As we're creating custom components, often we add elements to go through and uh, create the geometry of the custom component, but sometimes we need to actually take away a little bit of geometry. And I want to show you a couple different ways you can do that. For example, if we have something like this extrusion for the countertop, if we want to take something away with an extrusion, it's often easiest to go through and just cut an interior loop, which will take away some of the volume. So for example, on the countertop, if we edit the extrusion and I draw an interior box, something like that, what will happen is if we follow the pink line rules for creating just really pretty much any extrusion, if we have an interior loop, it'll actually cut away part of the volume. So when I close that, it will actually have a hole in the countertop that would be good for a sink or just some sort of penetration we need to have through that. That's sort of a really common operation. It's the easiest way to cut things away typically. It's just to go through and edit the extrusion and kind of subtract things away that way. Now that'll work for a lot of different cases, but there are some cases where you actually need to kind of do a little more elaborate cutting away. And when we want to do that, we can start thinking about using a type of object called a void. And a void is very much like a solid, but when we add a solid and a void, it'll cut away the geometry as opposed to adding to it. And let's take a look at an example that's a very common one of where we use that, and that's to actually go through and create a fireplace. 
So for example, I'm looking at here just the images or some images of the uh, King's Road fireplace, and you'll see that it's actually sort of a large mass, I think it's made of concrete, something like that, where we actually have the big mass with several smaller chunks just kind of cut through it. Okay, little openings on one side, openings towards the other side, and some voids on either side, just making sure that it's not such a large, solid mass of concrete. So voids on either side, as well as actually the flues. They're also what I could think of as voids. So let's think about how you can model an object like that using Revit. If I go back over to Revit, and I just switch to a floor plan view, let me go ahead and just uh, zoom on out so I can do this someplace where I have a little bit of room to work. And I'll just kind of put it out here somewhere in the middle of space. What I'm going to do is again go through and create a custom component, model in place, and we can think about really the best place to put. Oops, not that, excuse me. Oops, I guess I haven't saved this yet, have I? Well, we'll do that in just a moment. Uh, we can think about the best category to go ahead and put our fireplace in. I think for right now I'm going to use walls, but we could think about if there's a better category to put that in instead. I'm going to call this my fireplace. And when I want to create that, I'm going to start just by creating an extrusion, which is going to be the big overall mass of the fireplace. And I can make that, oh, about 4 feet by, let's say, uh, 14 feet, something like that. Again, I'm not paying attention to the precise dimensions, but this will sort of get the point across. And then for the length, I'll say that it starts at, or the height starts at 0 goes up maybe to 12 feet tall. We should also give it a material. I could go ahead and say it's cast in place concrete, but I might have more flexibility if I actually go ahead and say fireplace body. I'll duplicate that because then I can go through and change the appearance of that fireplace material easily without affecting all the concrete. Say OK to that. And when I finish that up, I should have just a large block of concrete. Let me zoom on out a little bit. Here we go, and we can sort of see it down there. Let me get the full navigation wheel so I can pan on up. And there we have a large block of concrete hanging around. Now if we want to start carving it away to make it more like a fireplace, what I can do is, taking a look at this, you'll see I have sort of these openings which are carving back into it. If I want to model those, I would probably do those as voids. So again, I'll go back to the floor plan view, zoom on in, and we'll do something a little bit different this time. What I'm going to do is go back to home. I'm going to add another element. I haven't finished this custom component, so I can add another form to it. And I'm going to again create an extrusion. And I can, oh, come back at some angle. Come on over. Come on back down. I could even mirror those if I really want to be quite precise about what's going on. Maybe I'll draw across the front here too. Or I could pick that line. I will need to go through and do the trimming to go ahead and close that up. Make sure it's a nice closed boundary. That looks good. In terms of the height, let's just say it's oh going from zero to say oh three foot, maybe three foot six, something like that. Okay. And the big change we're going to make here is we're going to say that's going to be a void as opposed to a solid. So if I say apply that. Close this one up. If I look at it now, at the cutting plane level, I'm not seeing it because at four feet, the void is actually below where I am, or what I'm looking at here. But if I rotate this around, maybe I'll do a little orbiting. You can see there's the opening. It's down at the bottom. So we can create fireplace openings like this. The void is just an object that you can go through and change and manipulate. For example, if I want to make it a taller opening, I can change the height okay, and it'll subtract that back out. And I can also manipulate it, oh, if I, for example, say that I want to, oh, what do I want to do? Let's see if I can select it in this view. I'm going to wireframe. It'll be a little bit easier to sort of see. Or I could just move my cutting plane down. I'm tabbing to get there's that cut there, that void. What I can do is do things like copy it, because it's just an object. 
maybe rotate it. And then, oh, how about even if I go through and align it, I will align the front edge here. Let's see if I can get that thing. Maybe I'll pull it out so I can see it first. Boys are always a little bit tricky to work with because they're yeah, invisible in a lot of views. Hmm. Let me do this. I'll go ahead and drop my cutting plane down so I can actually see it. What I mean by that is I'm going to go through and for the view properties. Actually, I can't do it in this view until I finish it. Let me, uh, now that I've finished it, as one of the view properties, let me drop the cutting plane down to three feet where I could actually see that void. Okay, there we go. Now I can edit this thing again, choose that void, and now I can do the alignment. It's interesting. There's a void it doesn't want me to align very much, but we'll go ahead and do it that way. I would like this. Okay, so far so good. What I might want to do is also go through and model those voids on the outside, which are really just uh, kind of making sure that the concrete doesn't get too thick. I guess this was really closer to this. Kind of just backing up one to the other. So to create that other void and form that shell, what I'll do is go to the extrusion. I will do some offsetting, maybe making those uh, shell walls about six inches thick. And I'll pick that wall, this wall, that wall, and that wall. And I'll TR to trim those up. That's looking pretty good. Before I complete that, let me also go through and change that to avoid and apply that. And I'll finish this out. Very good. So I hope you can see that using this method, we can really go through and build up almost anything we want to. If we look at that fireplace, we can create those shell surfaces, we can create the flues, we can kind of create the custom shape of that fireplace opening, but it's all a matter of kind of pulling the different pieces together and adding or subtracting to kind of make all the different pieces that need to be part of that custom component and define its ultimate geometry. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at one more example of a simple extrusion, and that's going to be, oh, it's actually a piece of sheet metal, kind of a hood for the fireplace that was also part of this house. Here's the example. If I'm reading this correctly, this is a sheet metal detail, and I believe what I'm seeing in here is really an elevation view where, you know, it's almost like half of a hexagon in terms of what's going on there. So it's really just sort of an extrusion coming up. Looks like over here we have, if I'm reading that part right, more like a hanging fireplace grate. Something like that. Not sure just exactly how the partition is related to that. It looks like just sort of a cover piece. But let's go ahead and sort of illustrate a general principle and then if you kind of like dig deeper in you might have a better sense of exactly how these work. Center line there, it's swinging out. It looks like this is made of several little pieces with a little grill and that. But it looks like it's pretty much just like a large hexagonal shell across the front of it. So how we could do something like that is, let's come back over again to Revit. If I want to go ahead and put something like that, and I know it doesn't belong to this fireplace, it actually I think it belongs to another fireplace in the house. But if we wanted to go through and put something like that here, let's take a look. We can come back over here. There's always sort of a strategic thing about really whether you want to go through and put it as part of the same element or want to make it as part of a separate element, whether they are really part of a single composition that will stay together or move separately. In this case, let me go ahead and kind of, oh, I'll just make it together as opposed to separately. But that's really just sort of more a decision about how you want to be doing your modeling. And if we want to go through and create something like that, we'll again come to home that probably also still is an extrusion. In this case, oh, what can we do? I'm always thinking about doing have a circumscribed or an inscribed polygon. Let's try this. 
what I'd really like to do is sort of do it right around that point there. So maybe what I need to do is like this. Let me go ahead and just put a model line in there first. Oops. I'll just draw a model line in there. And all I'm really doing with this model line is just giving myself sort of a place to hang some geometry. So that then I can go back and do my little uh, polygon. Now I'll have a center point. So I can do, what do I want to be? It's more like that. Maybe circumscribe would have been better. I should have thought about that before I got into this. Okay, but I think that is the approximate shape we have in mind. That's getting pretty close to what we have in mind, but not quite there. What I'll do is just do some more trimming on this. I'll do TR to trim. And I definitely want to cut just the first part of this. I'll get rid of those. If I want to accurately account for just the thin thickness of that, oh, maybe I'll make it like zero and like a half inch thick, something like that. Zoom on in so I can actually sort of see what I have in mind. And now I'll just offset some lines. And oh, it's so thin, it's going to be hard to even see what's going on. But with that thin shell, you can then do TR to trim. Let's see if I can get it on that side too. Oh, I know what happened there. I probably should have split that line first. But we'll do it this way. Close that up. Okay, and let's see if we can go through and complete this. I think that thing went from about like, oh, if we go back to the details. Wrong one. Oh, it's a PDF file, excuse me. Looks like it's about five foot four tall. If I'm reading it right, I'm not sure how it is off the ground. Maybe make it like a, I'll make it like three foot six off the ground, so it's kind of covering the top of the opening, and five foot four tall. So I'll come back over here. I'll say it starts at three foot six. I'll make it up to eight foot ten. Again, again, give it sort of uh, some sort of special material, and maybe make one just kind of like fireplace hood. And I'll give that kind of that coppery color or that tealy color too. Maybe even something lighter. More like a patinaed copper or something like that. Surface pattern, I'll say none to that. Say okay to all that. Finish. And let's take a look at what that's doing. Okay. We're getting close. It's uh, not exactly oh, exactly what's in the house because we don't, yeah, at least I don't understand the details well enough based on the kind of sketches that I'm looking at right now. But hopefully you'll be able to kind of start modeling that in more detail and actually create kind of an accurate representation of what that fireplace and the hood assembly look like so that you can actually include that in the house and have an accurate model. Now we've been talking a lot about extruding objects, but that's really only one of the basic methods you have for creating geometry. Let me go ahead and illustrate just a couple more so that you have a full repertoire of some of the things that are available to you. I'm going to pop back into the floor plan view and just kind of demonstrate some of the other ones for you real quickly. I go back to sort of, again, creating a model in place component. And I'll just make this a generic model for now, because I'm just going to be illustrating some general, ge general forms as opposed to some specific objects. Let's go ahead and do a blend for you and show you what that looks like. A blend is very much like an extrusion. The big difference between an extrusion and a blend is that it can have two different profiles. So, for example, I can go through and at the lowest level have a profile that looks like this. And then at the top level, I'll edit a profile at the top, and have a different profile. Something like that. Okay. We can go through and put in the difference between the two. Let's say still 12 feet, and put in some sort of category for it. 
For example, I'll go ahead and make this masonry brick. And when I finish my blend, you'll see that what it actually creates is just sort of a smooth contour between the two. That's not really a very good example because it's just sort of right on top of the other one. Let me go ahead and uh, move that around a little bit so that it's, uh, I guess I'm a little bit out of scale. So let me edit the base. I didn't mean to create something that was as big as the house, but uh, I should have paid attention. Okay. Again, I'm just editing the base. And I'll edit the top. Let's finish that up. You can take a look. Okay. And I think what you'll see is that you can get sort of uh, very interesting geometries by doing those things. We can go ahead and blend together two rectangular surfaces. We can blend together surfaces that have different numbers of vertices. Blend is sort of a very powerful tool. So think about how you can actually use that. A lot of shapes can be created just by blending together two different profiles. Okay. Another example of one that you want to be able to kind of include in your repertoire is something called a revolve. And let's kind of show you that. Revolves just really basically involve going through and creating one profile, which is basically the boundary which is or the boundary uh, that's going to be uh, revolved around something, and then actually have an axis line. So you just need to define those two different things. And we can do that on the floor. If we want to revolve it around an axis on the floor, we can do it in an elevation view putting uh, access on a reference plane that's vertical if we want to do it vertically. But let's just kind of show it on the floor so we can kind of get you something out there qu pretty quickly. Where what I'll do is again get to the floor plan level and I'll just do the revolve out a little further where we can see it. What I'm going to do is just start by creating sort of a boundary line and that boundary can be oh just as simple or as complex as you want it to be. I'm just going to go ahead and make more of an arc than anything right now. I'll go ahead and offset the arc on the inside. Okay, I still need to go through and close it. So what I'll do is just draw in the closure. Can I complete the profile that way? I'll zoom out, see if I can get the other side. Okay, so far so good. Now what we need to do is put in an axis line and depending on where we put the axis line it will revolve around it. If I put it on this side it will revolve around and really create in this case oh, part of a sphere or you can think of it as a donut however you want to think about it or more of a sphere. So we can take a look at that. So that's how you can create, if you think about using that capability, we create domes, we can create uh, spheres or things that are like spheres, and as you go through and create those things, it doesn't have to rotate the full 360 degrees, you can rotate it 180 degrees, okay, or from 180 to 0, 180 to 360, let's do that, you want to do the top half instead more of an igloo, something like that. So revolve is again a very kind of nice shape to be able to work with. And the final one, and I'll apologize for rushing through so quickly, I just want to sort of give you a sense of what you can do with these, is going to be called a sweep. So let's talk about how that one actually works. A sweep is kind of oh, a profile as well as just a path that you're going to kind of trace that profile around. So actually we've been using sweeps when we've been doing the baseboards, when we did oh, just kind of the sweep at the base of the King's Road walls. We've been doing sweeps to do those sorts of things and how they look in a general sense is we can choose the sweep tool. We can either pick a path or sketch a path. Picking a path would be, for example, just clicking on some 3D lines, so we could pick some edges and do that. Or let me go back to uh, sketching a path, that'll be more generic, where I can choose any old path. In fact, I can choose even a very arbitrary path like a spline. Okay. And 
what we need to do now is actually draw a profile on that path. And there's a little green reference plane that's showing there, which is the place where we could sort of sketch that profile. We can either load in a profile. Let me finish the path. I can either kind of choose an existing profile, one of the ones that's already loaded in here, or I can draw one if I want to. Let me just kind of choose something that's relatively simple now. Let's just do something simple. We'll just go through and do that one by 12, for example. And we'll choose that. If I go zipping on in there, you could see there the profile actually is relative to that path. And when I complete it, what it'll do is it'll stretch it along that path. And actually create just a 3D surface that follows that. If that wasn't what I had in mind, I could edit the sweep. And instead of selecting the profile, let me go through and oh, what I want to do, I actually want to edit the profile instead. Sketch the path. Oh, we're done with that. Edit the sweep. It's interesting. I'm wondering if it'll let me do what I want to, because I already did that the first time. Hmm. By sketch. That's how I would change it. Okay. Pardon me. I was looking for just how to find that. We can say edit the profile, and now I can go through and just draw anything that I want to. And really, I'm drawing on that plane. So I can draw any shape that I like. We put an arc on the top of that. That was a pretty sloppy arc. Let me do a little bit better than that. I'll go from here to here. Okay, and that'll be a complete profile when I finish that. It's a little hard to see, but if I zoom on in now, you'll see I actually have that profile there. So that's a sweep. A swept blend, just so you have it, I won't demonstrate it right now, is just really a sweep that goes between two different profiles. So if you have something that you want to change the contour along the length of the sweep, go ahead and use a swept blend instead. But hopefully that'll give you a sense of really what you can do in terms of trying to use these things. And let me point you to a resource that's just sort of a very helpful one if you want to sort of learn more about this whole kind of suite of capabilities. Again, that resource is the BIM curriculum that I worked on a little few years ago in terms of uh, just kind of putting together a lot of lessons about how to do these basic operations. If you want to sort of see some uh, just extra tutorials about how to do this, if you go to the BIM curriculum and look at, oh, there's a special section just on fixtures, fittings, and furniture, which is really very appropriate for what we're doing here. You'll find there's a couple different lessons about modeling in-place cloak, uh, components, how to modify a family definition or really create new families. So if you go to that modeling in place components, you'll actually find videos that really kind of talk about and give you some exercises to uh, kind of just play with these capabilities of creating the extrusions, the blends, the revolves, and just you know, these, these different techniques of creating these uh, kind of custom components. So that's a good place to get started.